for the work that you've done on the Ali Hub. Um, and the question I have to ask, and I guess it's probably for Sue, um, maybe more because she talked about it, was you said if Boris Johnson doesn't break the law, it, what is the possibility of him breaking the law? And if so, if he does break the law, what are the consequences? Thank you. I think, I think that um, he will try anything. I think probably his version of what is breaking the law is perhaps not the same as mine or yours or Parliament's. Uh, Sorry, I don't know how much of that you heard. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that um, he will try every trick in the book, as we've seen already, but there will be consequences, and there's another case uh, in the court uh, in Scotland at the moment, which is actually looking at whether they could actually send him to prison. Yeah. I don't honestly think it will come to that, but I do think it will seriously affect his ability to carry on doing his job. Hi, uh, thank you for really informative and interesting uh, talks. I just wondered, in your campaigning, when you've had dealings with officialdom in the UK, whether it's kind of local MPs that you've been sending your book to Atlanta or, you know, at conferences or whatever work you've been doing, uh, perhaps in context with maybe the Home Office or other, you know, official organised parts of government, have you got a sense, talking to people, because you've all been talking about the human impact of Brexit, have you got a sense that they really get it? That they're really um, understanding the impact that it's having on British citizens in the EU and also, of course, EU citizens in the UK? For anybody in the For all, for all, whoever feels it. I would say it rather depends on who you talk to. Um, we get the impression that the government in particular um, really don't see us. They don't hear us. They don't engage with us. Um, it took a very long time, I think, for the British government to even acknowledge that EU citizens existed. And thankfully now, they get much more of a voice than they did a year ago or two years ago. But I still think we are often not mentioned at all. But it does depend, if you talk to the right politicians, then they do understand, and it's important to keep getting that message across. I must say that um, at the very beginning, particularly when I, uh, we started uh, gathering testimonies, um, most politicians didn't really know what was happening. I mean, they had no idea of the impact. And then, of course, it depends. Some were are more receptive, so some are not. But that's, that's the idea. We, we need, and you know, as Sue was saying, we need to inform them. We need to speak to them. We need, and I was saying also, we need to speak up. And uh, so that's, that's the importance of, of the personal testimony. So the more we speak up, you know, the, you know, the, the, the more they, you know, some of them will become supportive, they'll understand our needs, and then, you know, and some, of course, won't. But, you know, that's the work we've, we've got to try to do. And personally, I think that Britain has uh, become a very divided country. You know, it, it's really lacerated by this, um, uh, you know, by, by Brexit and what, what's happening. And, you know, sometimes people are shouting at one another. And I think, you know, we need to, you know, bring the conversation. When we bring it to the human level, when we speak about, you know, starting from your own personal experience, that most of the time people, you know, are able to listen. And in the case, of course, of our book, it's just the quantity of, of stories. If one starts reading one after the other after the other, it, you know, even some Brexiters, at one point you're confronted with, you know, so much, you know, human suffering or anger or whatever, you know, and that, you know, you, you, you've got to have, a, you know, a response. So that's where you become, you know, I suppose, more, more supportive, more understanding. And it's the same for politicians because they're human beings. And, like us, yeah. So, do you want to say? Yeah, I just want to say I, I agree absolutely with Sue. It depends unbelievably which who is your MP and which politician you talk to. And uh, I mean, Mum and I, we live in the in the same town, so we had, we had the same uh, MP, and uh, and we've been. I think the first time we went together to our MP Joe Johnson. Um, <laughs> he was, uh, I think, actually, he was shocked. 
um, when we talked about, uh, especially I think mum, about because she has a family, she has children born in the UK, and I think he was genuinely shocked. I think uh, when when and that's correct with personal. So as Sue said, get in your laptops, pens, start writing. And often people say, okay, is there a template letter, which is okay but it is the personal stories write the story what you feel and that will get to them absolutely can i add that my mp is yes. theresa may <laughs> <laughs> so i've done very little hope despite all my efforts <laughs> just you are going to ask yes somehow you know we're luckier at least your johnson resigned <laughs> Can I just add one little thing about writing to people, as you said, it's not just M MPs, so if you've got an MP, great. Uh, write to the MEPs, yeah. please. Yes, yes, yeah. 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 Write to the MEPs, it's easy to find out who they are. If you haven't got an MP and you want to write to an MP in the UK, write your previous one, as said, Sue said, but you can also write to chairs of committees, and it's all on the Parliament website, and you can make the heading of your email or your letter a matter of national importance. Okay, so that's how that gets by um, sometimes, and it gets answered. So a matter of national importance. And the other thing that we've been doing a, a little bit more now in our group is writing to local newspapers. Your local newspaper in the town that you came from in the UK, write letters, give them stories, and it's really starting to work. We should have done that a long time ago. Yeah. I wasn't, uh, that question was for me, but I just wanted to answer something because <laughs> we actually, our first stop when we were organising this, we went to the consulate and we said, can we do this in conjunction with the consul? And we had a meeting with Annabella Sprout, who is the vice consul of the British consulate here in Barcelona. And uh, she told us that if the event was clearly pro-European, uh, so anti-Brexit, um, that they wouldn't be a speaker because the official position is that we're getting on with the Brexit. But they did tell us, in all fairness, lots of lovely words about how they really love to have, you know, fantastic, um, you know, intercultural, you know, the exchange of people that they wanted to welcome people and so on. And it all sounded very nice but uh, and different to what is being heard in the press. But we have to see if that pans out in terms of... Uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, the laws. And so finally, today, I rang up. I didn't tell anybody. I'm sorry, you're finding out now. I told the, I told the consulate that uh, we are having that event that you're not coming to, and we'd just like to you know, extend the invitation. If you don't want to speak, would you like to come and sit in the, uh, uh, you know, in the audience? And uh, they sort of went, oh, well, no, I can't give that message to the, to the consul or the vice consul. And I said, well, it's actually quite important because there's going to be you know, hundreds of people. And they said, you can send an email. And I said, can I please have the email address? And they said, go to the website. And use the <laughs> Okay? That's it. Next question. <laughs> yeah, hi. You've done a fantastic job talking about the uh, human aspect of, uh, of all this. But um, I was wondering about the economic case for um, immigration, because I don't know whether there's much research has been done. I've seen a few statistics banded around, and whether there could be a sort of some complementary work that would go with some of the either the individual cases or the overall cases that might make um, some of the more less humane uh, members of Parliament look up and think about the uh, the economic uh, aspect of it. Although my expertise is on citizens' rights, um, but uh, I think, yeah, uh, I think it is very difficult um, for me to say. But if people are not already convinced that the economical that Brexit or no new, especially no new Brexit is bad for for the UK as a country, let alone for the the, the people involved, yeah, I don't know. It's um, yeah, I actually don't know what to say. It is, it, is a, it is a good... But on the other hand, a lot of... In the UK, is talked about the economics. 
And um, we feel sometimes that uh, because it took a long, long time, like she said, that the citizens were actually being talked about as a, as a I mean, we were, uh, the EU citizens were the last ones who had a policy paper in case of no deal. I mean, there were many, many, I think, I lost, I lost, uh, lost track of Brexit ministers, but I think it was Dominic Raab at the time, who then uh, had many, many papers on fishery, on, on uh, agriculture, on, on uh, customs, and then finally in the end we came as well. But yeah, I thought it's, it's yeah, it, you need to ask an economist. Yeah, so even, I mean, it, it's, of course it's important, the economic impact, but the problem is most of the public who disagrees, you know, dismisses as fake news. It's always, I mean, it's, it's good, you know, project fear, you know, fake news. So it's really hard. I think it's under everybody's eyes. You know, if people have eyes to see, they, you know, they see. We know, we, we see all, even from all the EU citizens who are living, you know, we see academics, we see scientists, we see doctors. There's truly, I mean, the amount of people, nurses, for instance, last year, I think that 95 or 97 percent of nurses who were supposed to move to Britain to, to work didn't. I mean, it, it, what more proof do people want? And yet, they don't seem... The problem is sometimes, personally, I feel, you can speak to the mind of people. Populists, I always say, they speak, you know, at the belly. But we need to speak with the heart. And, you know, we've got to try at least to speak, you know, and, and see whether, you know, maybe making a case of, you know, look at my life, look at even my business devastation, you know, let me tell you how I feel. And I've seen when we went to the European Parliament, we had some members of the Commission there, you know, quite stern looking and everything, and they were in tears. And, you know, you wouldn't expect that from people at that level. But, of course, I mean, they're human beings like us, and maybe they had never really heard that, you know, approach like first person speaking and, and saying this is, you know, the impact. Um, so, yeah, more than that, you, you, you cannot do. I think, you know, it's evident, you know, it, it, Brexit is a bad idea. You know, it cannot be, it's not economically viable, I think, so, yeah. So, I don't know whether you want to add something else. I wasn't just thinking about the general economic argument of Brexit. I was thinking about more specific economic you know, cases about either family situations or that back up your 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 um, your cases, uh, that sort of thing. Right? Yeah. So, it's how much tax people pay compared with benefits they yeah. use. Well, sort of Tax-wise, uh, I mean, it's been proven that EU citizens yeah. bring into to the country more than they. But there's also a, also a risk about that sort of discourse. I mean, I, I, you know, you know, it's perfectly you know all right to know that you know we bring something to the economy. But it's also a very risky one, where you know you enter into the narrative of the good and the bad migrants. To me, they're only good and bad citizens, like meaning citizens who you know are trying to integrate and do their best to be in the country, like you do here in Spain. But if we start saying, oh, you know, this person is a good migrant because he earns a lot, and the other one does not, so therefore, you know, and you know, and then you know, if a person, what if a person falls ill? What if a person so? It, the idea of freedom of movement is really the circulation of, of EU citizens. It's the beauty, it's a great gift, you know, that, that, that Europe has given. And, and it's a gift that we should value. And I know, and, and not, you know, we not look at people just for what they bring, but, you know, for who they are. And, you know, and what they, sometimes you can't quantify. How can you quantify the work of a carer, for instance? Maybe, you know, I know a lot of EU citizens who look after in-laws that doesn't have an economic benefit, but, you know, it, it does, in a way, how, you know, it really helps society, so that, to me, is a good citizen, so. Is that what you wanted, the answer? Because I'm not quite sure I understood the question, if I'm completely honest. Can I, can I just say something about it? Please? Go on, then. Hi, I'm Bill and I uh, do stuff a bit with Remain in Spain, but an awful lot more with Dorset for Europe, which is one of the many, many groups that's in the UK out every weekend with Brexitometers, etc. And our feeling about this now is that it, you actually don't count at all with the people who are trying to push this forward, because the only way it makes any sense is for them to make us a low regulation economy. And that's why there is so much money being pushed into pushing it over the line. I agree with Sue, though. I don't think it's going to happen, so don't panic. But um, if you haven't yet seen the great hack, 
How many people have seen The Great Hack? One or two. If you haven't seen it, please watch that, because that's certainly worth understanding where a lot of this has come from. Um, and I'd also just like to say that um, <coughs> what you said about writing is absolutely really important. We've been busy writing, we've had sort of writing workshops, we've been down the pub basically, let's be honest, um, with, with some beautiful postcards of Dorset, etc. And getting people to write to whoever they wanted to. So in fact, a lot of the time we've been writing to the people who've been supporting us and saying thank you. So the Dominic Greaves of this world, etc. Because it's all very well writing to people who we feel it's a waste of time like Mrs May, etc. But how about giving all those people who've been getting foul emails and foul letters, you know, for what they're doing to try and protect our status in the EU, EU saying thank you to them? Because I know they make a difference. Yeah. I haven't been down to Sodom as much as I would like to, but whenever I have been, they've also been saying the same thing. Elspeth, who's down there all the time, uh, representing Remain in Spain, representing us all really, um, it says that, that the, the people come out and they talk to her and talk to Steve Bray and say thank you for sending these letters. So please, please, please do that. And also if you have any connections in Britain um, with people who are saying, I'm all on my own, I feel intimidated. Uh, I had this even the other day. I mean, the network's been out there for ages. Somebody in Lincoln saying, I feel I'm the only Remainer in the whole of Lincolnshire. I said, go and look for Lincoln in Europe. Lincoln, sorry, Lincoln for Europe. Look for your local group and then help them. And that will really begin to help you feel better about it all. Because it feels pretty shitty being on your own, doesn't it? But it feels much better when you realise you've got a group of people who are working with you, working for you. So just to say that as well. And who's coming on the march on the 19th of October? Yeah. Whoa, I was hoping for a few more hands. I was hoping for a few more hands because I think that's really, really, really important if you can possibly make it then. Well, the rights, sorry. Rights, yeah, there's the 12th, of course, because they moved the date. That's absolutely right. Hey, well done. So 12th or 19th, whichever you can make. Thank you. Okay, um, just want to see the bigger picture. Imagine well, if there is another election, okay? Um, if the new government, um, the leader of the opposition doesn't, give, I don't have any confidence in him, but if, they, if, they, if he becomes the Prime Minister, it's still unclear if he's going to, he's sitting on the fence, do you know what I mean? So it's still unclear uh, what actually he's going to do. Is he going to stop? Stop Brexit or the referendum or, or what? So it's still really depressing, isn't it? So you've got no, like, you've got Boris Johnson on one side and Colbert, and he, and it's not clear where what what the plan is. Do you see what I mean? There's always hope. I mean, I think, you know, we, we really need to do whatever is possible. We need yeah. to push as much as we can because one day we can sit down and say, I've done my best, which is not the best, but it's whatever we can. Okay. Um, I think that um, an election right now would actually not solve anything no, no. because it wouldn't move us any further forward than we are, and it's unlikely that anybody would get a majority. Um, so I think the, the thinking, even within the Labour Party now, is that a referendum has to come first. We have to get the Brexit um, situation resolved one way or the other before going into an election, because then a general election can be about all the other issues that need resolving. All the policies that all the parties normally fight an election on, so whether it's um, homelessness or austerity or all of or NHS or social care. There is a, so many problems in the UK that need fixing and none of those can be fixed until Brexit's out of the way because that's taking all the oxygen and all the resources. So I think the thinking at the moment is even within the Labour Party that they're trying to persuade the leadership that we have the referendum first. Uh, obviously, that seems to make sense, but anything is possible, <laughs> except Brexit, of course. How about the vote? Is that possible? Um, I 
Um, personally, I, I mean, I think it's it's possible eventually. I don't think it's an immediate option, and I don't think it would be regarded as a democratic option. I think it would be much easier to revoke if you have the public support to do that, and you do that by having a referendum. So yes, we have a referendum, the country says, we've changed our minds, this is a terrible idea, then we revoke. Then there's no argument, that will help to heal some of the divisions. But if we went straight for revoke, I think you're just dividing the country even further. Okay, I, I wanted to ask you, my English is not very good, so I, I hope I will uh, speak, uh, okay. Uh, I wanted to ask you, do you think that the failure of Thomas Cook had something about uh, of the problems of Brexit? Oh yes, without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah, yeah they, they said it even, yes. Even on the BBC, which has not been particularly generous to admit, you know, that Brexit was the cause of certain things. You know, I always found that it was always between line, hidden here and there. They mentioned Brexit. I mean, you know, it was the second cause uh, mentioned by BBC, which probably means that it was the main co cause. So, yes, of course, I mean, you know, businesses are not really helped by the situation. Everything is on hold. I mean, in limbo, as you know, it's been used because it's really, we, we live there waiting really waiting and not knowing what's going to happen. And also a lot of people wanted maybe to start businesses. They tell us, I'm waiting, you know, I'm waiting to buy a house, I'm waiting to start a business. This can't be good for a country. It, you know, we've been on hold for three and a half years now, so. Imagine if people are waiting to have their children. I mean, how long, it's been years already. <laughs> Where do I have my children exactly? <laughs> Next question. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm a member of Remain in Spain, and thank you, Sue, for keeping us all sane. Um, yes, I've been sending emails to lots of MPs all over the UK. I've never been an activist before, so and they do write back sometimes, and they are grateful, including Dominic Reeves, so I'd second that. My question is, I'm a psychologist, and I always work with culture change in big companies. And the one question that you have to address, I think, when you want people to get on board with something is, what's in it for me? And whilst I think there are people with empathy who hear a story that's somebody else and they feel sad, an awful lot of the people, it strikes me, who are behind leave, it's because they've been sold a, a, a slogan, you know, take back control or whatever it is. Now I'm worried about the, if we have another, we get another referendum, what's the rallying call of the Remain side, which is going to appeal to, to the great undecided or the great group that you can influence, who, you know, vote on Strictly Come Dancing and vote with slogans and simplicity rather than complexity. That's for any news. I think that um, that's the 60-40 thousand dollar question and I think that there'll be many brains in London working on what the answer to that one is. Um, one thing I would say is that we have to think about the things that we have in common with those who voted differently from us and there's one thing that we all have in common we have all been let down by this government no matter how you voted nobody is getting what they want so we have to look at the ways in which we are similar, uh, the, way, the places where we have common ground, and that's, that's got to be where we start. Because this situation is good for nobody, no matter what side of the, of the fence you sit on. Just want to add a little bit to that as well. That was a really interesting question. Thank you very much. I was reading about something very similar on Twitter yesterday, I think it was. And one of the suggestions that was the most popular on this thread was to move away from remain versus leave, uh, if there's another referendum, and to use the word stay, stay stronger, stay in, stay, because it's got a different sense and different meaning, but also to go back to your 
um, the slogans bit. I do believe, and I honestly think that we should never fight fire with fire. So if somebody says will of the people, or you know, I, I, don't, I don't believe in going back with more sound bites. This is my own personal opinion. I think, I think we always keep the higher ground. You don't agree? Yeah. Do you not agree? I think we've got the people who are already on the higher ground. I think we need to get the people who, who don't understand. We'll never get them. There will be that small percentage that we will never get. I accept that. I accepted that a long time ago. They're in my own family. I mean, it's just, it's just never, ever going to happen. But it's the ones... That, there, there is a softer element. And I think if you keep... Yeah, if you keep the language... I won't say the same. You can speak, you can speak stronger. You can, you, but I don't think that fighting slogans with slogans is the way to go. Remain, try that in, in the in the run-up to the referendum. And look where that got us. It, it got us nowhere. Can I say something? Yeah. I remember once I was, uh, of course actually with the three million, and there was Love Not Hate, that campaign, and they were explaining how, you know, we need to appeal to the center, the sort of soft, you know, um, levers, let's say. These are the people, even with the book, that we have been able to draw to ourselves because maybe they said, oh, I wasn't informed, oh, I didn't realize the human impact, oh, you know, and these are the people you can talk to. Then there is, you know, an element of, you know, core, like strong um, levers, and these people are really, really hard to convert, let's say. So normally you've got to look at the center, and how many people also haven't voted? I couldn't vote, but I was saying today, I think at the radio, I remember uh, that um, on the day of the referendum, two teachers were, were talking and saying, oh, are you going to vote? Oh, I'm not sure, I don't know what to, what to vote for. And I was thinking, oh, I can't vote, and here are two people who, you know, could be bothered. And we, we need, these are the people we need to, you know, to speak to and to encourage, but I agree, totally agree, that you know, unless you know, we, we can't keep shouting at one another. At one point, you've got to say, okay, let's have you know a conversation. Let let's look at one another in the eye and, and speak. So yes. Was wasn't one of the problems in two thousand and sixteen that young people didn't go out to vote? Absolutely. And how can you address that? There's two in this room that really need to stand up. Yeah, Molly and and yes. I reckon let's discuss that actually because in my group I have a group called Young European Voices, which is by young Europeans for young Europeans, and it also includes third country nationals, UK in EU and EU in UK. And what we do as well is we're trying desperately to get young people involved. Because they like one thing they have many fears, just to highlight one of them is they're afraid if they are politically active of not getting a job. Because a lot of employers sadly see it as, you know, a disadvantage when I personally see it as a positive. Mm -hmm. But they have that issue. The other one, of course, also is that they're apathy. And they sometimes, sometimes say apathy kills. Mm. Because they're being passive and they do care. But I'm trying to say to them, get out there, get in the streets, protest, get on social media. And that's the hard bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's also, it doesn't matter what age group you are, it's trying to get them to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's saying, like, getting them to care and going... Okay, you see, like how they're protesting for freeing Nelson Mandela, the civil rights movement. That was all. Oh, a lot of the time, that was based on the progress came from young people, and that's definitely one major issue we're having at the moment. And I think that's in numerous young European groups. You said something very good about the apathy. Yeah. That's a real problem in Britain. Yeah. You know, it's really to get people engaged. You know, it's true that a lot of people, and you know, many British know, it's not really common to speak about politics. You don't speak politics on the table, whereas. You know, us, you know, for instance, I'm Italian, we, we live, you know, we, we have all, we always people politics, so it's much easier for us. But that's, again, these are the people that we need to reach out. And I think, you know, young people like Molly, who are really an example, I mean, like, yeah. are doing, you know, a lot to, you I know. Mean, we're trying our best, but it's just, it's just hard. I mean, that's one so. thing that just frustrates us on a daily basis, even in our own friend groups. It's in our friend groups, it's our universities, our families. It's just, as we have the same experience, it's not just young people, it's people in general. And so if anybody has any ideas, please let me know. We need as many as possible to motivate people, so. Well, we've linked it quite successfully with extension. Okay, um, yeah. we were supposed to finish at half past eight, it's almost nine. And there's one gentleman, he's put his hand up ten times. I'm going to give him the last question, even though I've been told I have to shut down. <laughs> I'll keep it short. Okay. I'll go get the microphone if I'm I hope everyone's all right about it. Um, I think what we're doing is a bit nice. 
and we're writing to our MPs, we're not fighting the MPs, we're fighting sock puppets. We're fighting, sorry, fighting is a strong word. We're up against sock puppets, astro terrorists, we're up against robots on social media, on, if you go on the Guardian, on the SIF, with, on the comment is free like I do, the fella beans here, hello fella. Um, look, we're not playing with humans here, we're playing with paid, we're, we're pay, playing with people who are paid to actually go on and fight our or against our argument with lies. There are lies being spread. How do we fight against that? How do we come up against that? This thousand of Don't get mad. Don't, don't <coughs> engage with trolls. Because that's the idea. You you basically amplify the, the message. Okay. So if you all stop reading it, I have stopped tweeting, you know, Me things too. with yeah. And you know, and keep sending instead positive messages or messages you want to reinforce. But leave them alone because that's exactly the you know the trap they set for us so that the message gets through. That, that's the maximum. You know, it's not maybe much, but it's it's you know if we all did it, they will stop immediately. So we don't know, be spread. Don't don't, don't, don't engage. I never know. engage. <laughs> don't waste your time when you could be spending that time talking to people who you can mm. convince. Okay. So the last. Uh, Last word, we really uh, want to give a very special thank you to Mammon, who organised yeah. almost yeah. everything. Yeah. to us, to them, um, or, you know, speaking on the way out, but we should start to uh, leave the sala because we, we're, we're over time, okay? And just, just, oh, just reminding that we would really appreciate any donations that you would be willing to make so that we can continue this hard work, and the donation box is just over there. Okay. I'd just like to say, anybody who's come here from Remain in Spain, I would love to get a photo with all the Remain in Spain members. That would be wonderful. And I'd also just like to point out our special guest at the back who's just arrived after a late flight is Eu Superville Kathleen Penn.